Okay. Good morning. morning. Greetings to you on this fifth Sunday in Lent. It's amazing to think that Easter is just two weeks from now, Uh, but so it is. And we're delighted that you all are are here with us this morning. Uh, I particularly want to want to mention mention a couple of folks who have not been here for. I think over a year uh, because of uh, uh, health issues, but are here this morning, and that's Donna and Bruce Bible. Welcome back. Oh, just pile, and uh, let me see. I know Ron is here. Is Karen? Okay, they're coming. Uh, Yeah, we've got we've got uh, several miracles. A growing number here, even, uh, and it's and it is great to see. Um, uh, those of you who are joining us via uh, via the internet on uh, Facebook or YouTube, thank you for joining us as well. And uh, if you were here, I think you could see that that the numbers are growing. Uh, folks are getting back once vaccinated and. Ready, ready to get out, and uh, we're we're hopeful that we'll see you as well before very long. One one time uh, that we particularly might see you, and for everyone else as well, of course, is uh, Holy Week, which begins a week from today on Palm Sunday, uh, with our our regular Sunday morning service. Uh, also during Holy Week, we will be having worship on Monday Thursday at 7 o'clock, and that will be a Holy Communion service, of course. On Friday, uh, April 2nd, we will be having two services. One uh, will be uh, a service of, of uh, prayer and meditation at noon here in the sanctuary, and then later in the day at 7.30, we will be having our annual tenebrae. Service then on good on uh, on uh, Easter, uh, we will be gathering at Jane Raider's home on uh, on the hill at uh, six o'clock and beginning our Easter sunrise service whenever the sun begins to come up, and then uh, in person worship at ten o'clock. And so that's an invitation for anyone who is who is watching. And of course, everyone here, we hope, can be at that as well. Um, One other personal thing uh, to mention, and that is uh, a happy, it's coming up Thursday, but we can can do this today, I think, uh, a happy 49th anniversary to 
George and Marianne Chenoweth. Congratulations. I haven't even been alive 49 years, so that's, you know, I'm really impressed. <laughs> yeah, I know, Ninth Commandment and all that, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, please, please take note of the other announcements that are in the bulletin. I'd particularly mention that the uh, Southern Seven Health Department and the National Guard continue to be at work at the Main Street Center on Mondays and Tuesdays uh, between 9 and 5. And if you need to get vaccinated, uh, anyone out there, if you need to get vaccinated, please give Southern Seven a call and make an appointment, and they will be happy to run you in. All right, I think, uh, I think that, should, that should do it, so let's worship the Lord.
Thank you, Shirley. Please join me in our call to worship, which comes to us today from the 99th Psalm. The Lord is great in Zion. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Exalt the Lord our God. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you and praise you for bringing us together this morning, for giving us the freedom to worship in the splendor of holiness. Father, we call upon you today as our Redeemer, as our protector, as our provider, uh, as all good things, and asking that as we praise your holy name, as we lift our voices in song, as the word is proclaimed, we and your people pray, we ask that your Holy Spirit would inhabit each person here and each person joining us remotely, that together, our hearts may be lifted to your throne and all the hosts of heaven with you might be glorified for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I announce the opening hymn, just a just a uh, an announcement that the choral ensemble that uh, we I think everybody's been contacted will meet immediately after church in the choir room, and kind of a tease for next week. We're going to have a little different look up here for at least one song. So stay tuned. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number sixty. Come, Christians, join to sing. I uh, just wanted to, to let you all know uh, that over the next several months, once a month, uh, the missions team is going to take a few minutes in the worship service to highlight the missionaries and organizations uh, that are working around the world that we support. We're hoping that at least a couple of those uh, updates on what's, what's going on with these folks will be in person, uh, but 
that's still to be worked out for this morning. Uh, Jennifer is uh, leading off with a uh, word about Megan Reeder. Good morning, everyone. Um, our committee has uh, kind of been on a standstill as everything with the, with the pandemic and everything are getting back to me and getting back to a slow normal. In this process, we will be coming at the pastor's once a month leading up to this fall where we will have a Mission Sunday. In that, we hope to bring as many as we can, either in person or in live, to give them your updates as you all are also supporting them, whether it's financial, prayer, or just in thoughts. But the one that we're showcasing this, this month is Megan. Megan is originally from Southern Illinois. She was raised, and well, she was born in Murfreesboro, she wanted me to tell you that, but she was raised in DeSoto. She's just a year younger than I am and has seen the world in more ways than some of us can even imagine. Uh, her parents now live in Carterville. Now, with that being said, she then went on to Wheaton, and that is with this right here, the first screen. And Megan has worked with Wycliffe since early 2005. She earned the MA in Marriage and Family Therapy in Wheaton College. She is now preparing to take her license examination while she is where she's at. And we'll show Kim, we'll talk about that in a little bit. After Wheaton, she spent two years supporting Bible translation and other ministries, counseling other missionaries, local kingdom workers, and their families in the Philippines. Then a year in Dallas, Texas, working towards her license of marriage and family therapy license and other requirements for new therapists. Now let's move on to what we're talking about today. She is with The Well. Since April 2018, Megan has lived in Southeast Asia, counseling missionaries and their families. Me Megan is based at what is called The Well International. It's a member care facility that offers clinical counseling, physical wellness services, debriefing, and soul care for missionaries. That's right. She's helping missionaries. Missionaries need help just as much as we do. In fact, we'll get to the next slide and show that they are actually in need, if not more than what we need, because of what they come in contact with and deal with personally, as well as what they're coming in contact with emotionally daily. With that, they also assess and treat the emotional, mental, and spiritual health of the cross-cultural cross-cultural workers. The clinical team at the well are well-mastered and master's level trained professionals who maintain standards required by their passport countries. English is the primary language at, at the well, but services are also available in Thai, German, Mandarin, Spanish, and Korean. Why Shai Mai? Chiang Mai is the second largest city to Bangkok. Now Bangkok is where she will be traveling next month to take her licensing. So she not only is dealing with the pandemic, dealing with being away from her family, she chose to stay there because not knowing if she'd be able to travel with travel constraints to go back to where she, uh, where she is called to serve right now. So she maintained her station. And um, with that being said, she will be continuing her licensing and traveling to Bangkok. So in the next few weeks, stay in prayer for not only of her examination preparation, um, it's hard to be far away. It's one thing to be away from to college and you know talk to your mom and dad, but you can't drive home for that visit or that debriefing or that you know where you can just lock yourself in your room and but come out and have that home cooked meal. She, she's doing all of this over there in Thailand. She is considered, uh, Chiang Mai is considered to be the hub of Southeast Asia because of the location, only a three hour plane ride to anywhere in the region. Thailand is missionary friendly and has an open religion policy allowing any religion to exist. Years ago, Protestants found Chiang Mai an excellent location for missions training and support for the region. There are over 2,500 missionaries based in Chiang Mai, with about 100 mission institutions. At training bases, new missionaries learn Thai, Chinese, and other religial, re, regional languages. 
Chiang Mai is mostly a Buddhist region. The statistics are very scary. 80% of missionaries burn out and don't finish their term. 46% of missionaries have been diagnosed with a psychological issue, and those 87% are diagnosed with depression. Free Reign International Missionary Care Group is the source for that, st for that statistic. Missionaries are ordinary Christians, just like you and I, following extraordinary calls, going where God leads them, but they are not superhumans. They're still human. In fact, they are just like the rest of us, struggling with their finances, their families, their marriages, and, parent, and some of them are parents, as well as may also have private addictions that no one knows between them and God. On the top of that, the cross-cultural cross -cultural ministry is incredibly stressful. Though overseas min ministry can be incredibly rewarding and joy-filled, it can also be extremely draining, discouraging, and anxiety-producing. Here's the myth of the invincible missionary. Some field missionaries experience significant traumas like kidnapping, threats to life, family, friends, rape, armed robbery, shootings, murders, torture, imprisonment, natural disasters, earthquakes, some even have experienced tsunamis while when those hit in medical emergencies. And right now they're facing the pandemic on top of that. They may also experience government opposition, false accusation, betrayal by friends, lack of support from family back home because they don't understand their calling, cancellation of projects, serious team conflicts of, of different minds and different beliefs, and much, much more. Believed do not think it is strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to you to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13. So here are some updates from Megan. Megan had hoped to return home to the States for a two month visit, but the pandemic changed those plans. So she had left Thailand and it had been months or more before she could return. So she decided to stay, continue her work. And as I stated earlier, continuing her examination for her licensing here in the United States as well. The pandemic increased the number of missionaries in Thailand. Many of them were stationed and their calls were canceled and they're stranded in Thailand. The Wells Wick waiting list grew as coronavirus refugees sought debriefing, counseling, and much, much more due to the upheaval of this pandemic. It has been a privilege for them to serve one another and serve them in their unexpected and ambiguous transitions and are grateful that Thailand was taking steps to mitigate community transmission of COVID within their own government. About a third of the Wells counselors are stranded in their home countries and don't know when they will return to Thailand. Though they are eager, eager to do so, their travel constraints from wherever they are and where they're originally from is at a standstill. So we may board, we, we, they made a board with their faces on it so we don't miss anybody when they pray and when we pray for them. More updates. Due to COVID and other factors, a few faithful regular financial partners are no longer able to partner with her financially. So she asks if you would pray for her that the Lord would provide for that monthly shortfall through this and the next days ahead. And she also sends a sincere, a sincere thank you to all of you for so much for continuing to encourage, pray, partner financially with her in her Wyclef, in her Wyclef ministry. And what we all do allows her to keep doing what she is called to do, not what she's doing, but what God's doing through her. And to keep turn, and, and which turn helps many Christian workers doing what they do. 
So it's like what we always say, treat everybody as you would like them to be treated. But go and greet everyone that you come in contact with, with the Spirit of Christ. They receive the Spirit of Christ, and they continue to give it over and over and over again to whoever they come back into contact with. Pray for everyone she comes into contact with, that who they come into contact with, and every single person that she comes in contact with or is with has a family. And pray for their families as well. We thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. If you'll please join me now in prayer. Lord, thank you so much that we can worship together. Uh, thank you for the sunshine this morning and for the reminder of the new season. Um, we praise you so much, God, that you are in control. Uh, we, you do not call us to be in control, though many of us often try to take those reins every day. Lord, we give those back to you and uh, remember that you you are our God, and you love us. Lord, we thank you so much for Megan and the work that she's doing. Uh, be with her, God. You know her prayer request. Um, Lord, you have called her to do this work, and you will fulfill the financial shortfall and all the other um, issues that she is facing. Um, Lord, just be with her as she does minister to other missionaries, Lord. Father, we lift up everyone that's ministering in your name, um, which is all of us in our community as well, Lord. Um, Lord, you have called each of us to be a missionary wherever you've placed us. And Lord, I just pray that we would continue to take that mission seriously um, and that our eyes and hearts would be open to everyone around us, Lord, um, that you bring across um, our paths. Lord, we're so thankful for those that are uh, back with us worshiping again after so long. Um, Lord, we just praise you for continued health and growth in so many in our church family. Lord, we do lift up um, Barb Throgmorton. Thank you for a successful surgery, Lord, and just be with her as she continues to heal. Um, Lord, we do continue to lift up Bobby Hoyle um, with his battle in cancer. Lord, just give him peace. Um, and sustain him daily as he is facing um, <clears throat> this disease. Father, we do finally just lift up um, the knowledge and wisdom for the researchers and medical teams and the protection for healthcare workers and everyone fighting COVID and all the diseases in our world, Lord. Um, Lord, be with our frontline medical workers who often get caught up um, in the politics of this disease. Um, Lord, sustain them, be with them. And as we saw with the missionaries, Lord, be with their mental health, be with their emotional health. Um, send your people to be around them and support them spiritually as well. Father, we love you so much. We praise you for this church, for the leadership. We praise you for our community. Lord, be with us all as we seek to see your kingdom on earth, Lord. Um, I pray all these things in Jesus' name who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Today's, take this off. today's Old Testament reading is Psalm 95, and I noticed that our first hymn was from this. Let us sing songs of praise. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord God, for the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. 
for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Mirabah, as on the day at Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they hadn't seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest.
until he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. It's been almost a year since I picked that thing up. When we went to practice yesterday, I couldn't remember where all the buttons were. <laughs> uh, good to get back to that. Thank you, Mandy. Please stand for the reading of the gospel, which comes to us this morning from the gospel according to John, chapter 4, verses 19 through 26. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. For the last four weeks, uh, we've been talking about the disciplines of spiritual life that are meant to draw us closer to our God and Savior and that we are all called upon to practice at, 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 uh, at, uh, in, um, with, <laughs> with regular routine. I don't know what phrase I was looking for, but it disappeared. With regular routine uh, in, order for that, in order for that to happen. Uh, the first four that we've dealt with, uh, scripture study and uh, meditation, prayer, fasting, and silence are all things that are done primarily, not exclusively, uh, of course, but, but primarily by ourselves, alone, between us and God. For the last one, I'd like us to look at something a bit different. Uh, most folks do not think of worship as a spiritual discipline. It's simply something that you do uh, every Sunday morning, maybe Sunday evening, maybe Wednesday evening as well, depending upon your, your church. Um, but you do it because, well, that's what we do, right? I mean, you've, we've all, I shouldn't say we, all, uh, most of you have learned that uh, from when you were little kids, right? Uh, Mandy, your, your kids have been coming to church. That's what Sunday morning has been about. Um, all their lives. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've, had, I've had plenty of people tell me they couldn't conceive of doing anything different because, well, it's just what you do. I'd like to suggest that we can look at worship as a spiritual discipline, as something that we do on a regular basis with intention and, and with purpose, the same way that we can deal uh, that we can do uh, studying of scripture or praying or fasting or being silent. And to do that, I'd like for us to take a look at the 95th Psalm. Uh, 
The 95th is for, for many, the, uh, at least the first seven verses of it, are the, uh, the passage in scripture about, about worship uh, that, that say the most. Uh, to give you an example, in the Anglican church, uh, in every morning, every service of morning prayer, uh, during the week or on Sunday morning, it begins with a recital by the congregation of the first seven verses of this psalm. Okay, uh, that's not an accident. That's not just because you know they're being lazy and it's easy to do the same thing over and over again. For over a thousand years, services of prayer and worship in the Christian church have begun with this psalm. Uh, offering it, as it were, to the Lord as an expression of praise, of gratitude, and of joy uh, on the part of all of his people. Um, and it begins with something that is actually not at the beginning. For, for me, this psalm actually begins with verses 6 and 7. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hands. I say this is the beginning of the psalm because this is the call to worship, right? This is the call to all of God's people to come before him. Now, the word worship that is used there and that we use you know, much of the time without even thinking about it, means to bow down. Uh, it means to give obeisance. It means to acknowledge another's worth. Uh, or it can also mean to submit. Okay? Worship has all of those meanings. And in fact, all of those meanings are expressed in our worship of God. Um, it's something that can, in theory, be given to anything. You know, if what you really want to, uh, to bow down to and acknowledge the worth of and submit to is a golf ball and clubs, you can do that. Right, Ron? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not putting you on the spot. Uh, there are a lot of people here who could, who could say that. You can worship golf balls and bags. Uh, and clubs. You can worship money. You can worship power. You can worship your children or your spouse. You can worship the family home place. You can worship your boss. You can worship in the sense of bowing down to, submitting to, acknowledging the worth of virtually anyone or anything. But despite that, there is in fact only one proper object of worship. Only, only one, okay. Uh, it's interesting, uh, to, just to illustrate this idea, uh, in the British Commonwealth, um, mayors and magistrates and justices of the peace are still addressed, you know, in, in the United States we might, we might say your honor, right? In the British Commonwealth, they, the form of address is your worship. If you've ever heard that, you know how odd that sounds, okay? But it's simply a way of respecting the person and even more respecting the office, acknowledging it, and uh, in a sense, uh, submitting to it, okay? Uh, we, we can do that with anything. But worship is not just about a mode of address. It's not just about a mindset or an attitude. More than anything else, worship is about our relationship with our creator and redeemer. And obviously, uh, neither golf, nor money, nor power, nor spouse, nor children, nor boss, nor job, nor educational degrees, or anything else is our creator and redeemer. All right, uh, they're all good things, but not to be worshipped. Now, the the bodily the bodily postures uh, posture that's mentioned here postures worshiping and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. We don't 
bow down here. We don't kneel, okay? We could. I don't know about you, I'm not sure I'd ever get up uh, <laughs> if we did that, but we could, and there's a reason for doing that. Uh, we worship, or I'm sorry, we kneel or we bow down before God uh, when acknowledging, <laughs> quite frankly, that he is so far above us as, as to be, as to be uh, well, a different kind of being. He is above, we are below. He is the source, we are the recipients. He is the creator, we are the created. He is the redeemer, we are the redeemed. And that being the case, according to verse seven, we are the sheep of his hand. Sheep, how many of you, how many of you raise or have raised sheep? Several folks, several folks have, yes. You do, yes. Um, uh, sheep don't control their lives very well, do they? No. Sheep, um, uh, sheep don't plan out how, how they're going to spend their day. No. Uh, they don't make long-term plans, right? No. Uh, are sheep dumb? Yeah. Yeah, sheep are dumb. We're not dumb. We're capable. We're capable of planning our day. We're capable of making long-term plans. We're capable of controlling our lives, at least to the extent that we can make a mess of them. The reason that we're compared to sheep is because, like them, the people of God are not supposed to be controlling their lives. The, the, the people of God are not supposed to be in charge instead the God to whom we bow down and to whom and we offer worship uh, is, is the one who does that. We are led by him, we're fed by him, we're protected by him, we're nurtured by him, and worship is what we give in return, not as, not as part of some kind of bargain, but rather as an expression of our appreciation, an expression of our, of our gratitude, an expression of our love for the one who does that for us. So that is the call to worship. Then we go back to the beginning of the, of the uh, psalm and we see how we are to worship in verses one and two. We're to we are told, oh come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. As Julie pointed out uh, in reading Psalm 95, uh, come, uh, Christians joined to sing is indeed based on this psalm. And we sang that at the beginning because that is what we are called to do. We're called to sing, to raise our voices in making a joyful noise to him. To sing to God, quite frankly, is to make him important. We sing to those we love, not those who are incidental in our lives, okay? Um, uh, has anyone, anyone here ever had the desire, I'm not saying that you've actually done it uh, or that you've ever actually composed a song of any kind, but has anyone here ever had the urge to compose a song to your mailman? Has anyone here ever had the, the, the desire to compose a song to the folks who pick up your garbage? Anyone here ever had the desire and, and the overwhelming impulse to, to, um, to, uh, uh, to uh, write a song specifically for the IRS agent you dealt with during your audit? If you did, it'd probably come out like something from a death metal band, so I'm not sure that really qualifies. But uh, yeah, we, 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 write, we write songs to people who matter to us, to people we love. Uh, I've never actually written a song to Marianne. Uh, that's at least in part because if I ever actually sang it to her, she'd run out the back door screaming at the top of her lungs, calling calling the wife abuse people. Uh, but but, but I, have, I have had the urge 
to do that because she's someone important enough to me to want to sing to. That's why, that's why we do that. We don't just do it because we like music, okay? We don't just do it because uh, we, we love to sing. We do it because of who it is that we are singing to. Let us sing to the Lord. Make a joyful noise. Joyful noise is where my voice comes in. It's, I hope, joyful when I sing, but it is a noise. Nobody's ever going to confuse me for Dion Warwick or Adele, all right? Um, but I do it because I want to and because of who it is that I am singing to. We do it to give thanks. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. And we give thanks, of course, uh, because gratitude puts our relationship with him uh, into its proper perspective. We are thankful for who he is and for all that he's done for us. This is not a, a relationship of equals. Well, he's thankful for what we've given to him. He doesn't need to be thankful for what we give to him because he doesn't need what we have. Everything we have that we need, that we receive from him, we give, we give thanks to. He's the provider in this covenant, not us. We give praise. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Some people think that it's silly to praise God. Have you ever heard that? Why would, we, why would God need or want our praise? Well, he doesn't need. He doesn't need our praise. He doesn't need us to tell him who he is. It's relational, once again. We praise God uh, as a way of telling him that we understand, we appreciate uh, who he is, that we don't take him and his good gifts for granted. Um, we, th we think, well, God doesn't need praise. People need praise. But the truth is a lot of people don't need praise either. I don't, I don't need anybody to tell me uh, what a wonderful guy I am. I know it. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't need people to, 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 to point out my, my particular strength. I need people to point out my weaknesses and, and my failures. I don't need people to point out, point out my strengths. The chances are pretty good that I know what those are. Do I like people to do that? Yes. Do I appreciate the fact that they appreciate what I do? Yes. It's good to hear that. We all, we all feel that way, even with the stuff that we know that we're good at. God doesn't need that. But he desires that simply as his way or our way of relating to him. Okay, so that's how we worship. We praise, we sing, we, we give thanks. The foundation of our worship, of course, is not in any of that. The foundation of our worship is in the person and the acts of God, and that's what verses three through five are about. Uh, the Lord, for, in other words, because, we do this because, the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also, the sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. This is simply a way of saying everything that is. Everything that we are, everything that we have, every relationship that we've been given, every skill or talent that we've been given, uh, the world that's, that's around us, the places where we are, it's all, it's all God's gift. He is the creator and the sustainer of all things, everything, everything. Our worship is because of who he is. Above all, it is because of his son. We worship because of who Jesus is. God come to earth and living as one of us and experiencing everything that we experience, including our griefs and our pains and our sufferings and death itself. And we give thanks for him doing that for the purpose of redeeming us from death, as well as from sin 
and the powers of darkness. Now, you may say, well, what's any of this got to do with the discipline of worship? Simply this, like any skill, like any talent, uh, like, like any ability, for instance, the ability to play a musical instrument, if you don't practice it, if it's not a discipline of routine, it atrophies. Uh, that's, why, that's why I appreciate folks, as for instance, Bruce and Donna have, have told me, uh, even when they couldn't be here uh, through, through all those months, they still watched the service once we started broadcasting it. They, they, they watched the service because it was important to continue to exercise that ability to worship. It continues to be important to, to, uh, to build on and to strengthen and, and to, to constantly renew that relationship. Picture it this way, and, and this is, this is a, very definitely a parallel with prayer. Uh, if, if, uh, if I value my relationship with my spouse and I don't talk to her for weeks or months at a stretch, what's the impression she's going to form of, my, my, uh, of, of the importance of, of our relationship to me? It's not, right? It wouldn't be. In the same way, when we ignore God, when we do not pray or worship him, okay, when we don't acknowledge who he is, when we don't ascribe to him the worth that, is, that adheres to his name, when we don't submit to him on a regular basis and acknowledge that he is who he is and we are who we are, that atrophies. And before long, frankly, we're on our own. I don't think it, it is, it is uh, unfair to say that the last year has been one of the most challenging in the history, at the very least, of the church in America. Okay? We've been persecuted, not by the government, but by a virus, a mindless thing that just does what it does because it's programmed to do it, and it has been a plague, not just on society in general, but on the church in particular. Uh, there, there are churches, uh, there are churches within driving distance of this one that have not been open since last March. That's incredible to me, absolutely incredible. Uh, yes, we took the necessary precautions last March. We stopped meeting for a time. We resumed as soon as we felt like we could and as soon as, as uh, the state of Illinois gave, the, gave the, the clear to do so, as soon as we could. And, and even at that, some, some might say, you know, we never should have stopped. And maybe we shouldn't. That's a debate for another day. But the reason why it's an important question is because our worship is not just about gathering together on Sunday morning and singing a couple of songs and hearing uh, a, 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 a sermon uh, and, and praying together. That's, that's all important. But what we do here on Sunday morning is we renew on a regular basis, we renew our relationship with our creator and our redeemer, our provider, and the one who gives us all things. Let that discipline, that week by week by week discipline get set aside and that relationship starts to crumble. That's why it needs to be a discipline and why all of you here
Thank you for being here. Those of you who have been here all along, thank you for doing that. Those of you who have been watching via the internet, thank you for doing that. You all have been keeping up that discipline. For those of you who aren't here, hopefully you'll see this. And if you do, keep, keep that in mind. Don't, please don't make what you're doing right now a lifelong habit because while in an emergency it was a good thing to do and a necessary thing to do, what we are called to do is to come together as the people of God, to hear one another as we sing, to pray together, to hear the word and to meditate upon it and discuss it together. Join us. Join us when you can. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us the privilege of worship, the discipline of coming together to renew on a regular basis our relationship with you as well as with one another. Father, we ask that in the days ahead, as more and more people are vaccinated, as more and more restrictions are lifted, as your spirit calls to each of your people, that you will complete the process of bringing your people back together, that as one, we may worship and glorify your holy name, for we ask it for Christ's sake. Amen. As Pastor said, uh, let's continue to make a joyful noise to God today with our closing hymn number 90, O for a thousand tongues to sing. the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of counsel sin, he sets the And now, as you depart, receive this benediction from the Lord. May the God of all grace, who has called us into worship of his holy name, and by his spirit joined our hearts together that we might do so with one heart and voice, go with us and be seen in us and work through us, both now and forever. Amen.